Live truth, speak truth. This is the Jacob Kersey Program. Welcome to the podcast at Real Jacob Kersey on the socials if you would like to connect with me. Thank you so much for listening. Really quick, would really appreciate if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, if you would leave us a review. Helps us fight the algorithm police whenever you leave a rating and review. Because believe it or not, Christian conservative voices are being censored and silenced. In fact, on my Facebook page, someone revealed to me recently, even though I'm no longer restricted on Facebook. Facebook has restricted me multiple times for supposedly saying hateful things. In fact, I had uh, a friend who's been on the show before, Billy Hallowell, had posted Jesus paid it all, or Jesus died to save the sin, something along that lines, and they removed it saying it was hateful, saying it was hate speech, and he was restricted. And then all of us, you know, although Facebook will say, well, now your account's not restricted anymore, they still shadow ban people like us. I had a friend looked up my name, or a new friend looked up my profile on Facebook the other day. I was like sixth. As far as I know, Jacob, there, there are really no other Jacob Kersey's out there that have a, a podcast, but Facebook has me way down on the list, hiding my account. Um, so it might take you some time if you want to connect with me on these socials. But all that to say, your help in, in fighting the algorithm, please, you leaving a rating, you leaving a review is very, very helpful in that. So thank you for doing it. Before we get into the meat of the show, I just want to tell you about Ramika Designs. Look, if you go home every day and you're tired of seeing the same fixtures, the, 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 the same signs, the same home decor that all your friends have at the office, you might want to try personalizing your decor, your drinkware, your cutting boards. If you go to RamikaDesigns.com, they can help you do that. They do custom laser cuttings and engravings on almost all materials check out ramikadesigns.com r-o-m-i-k-a designs.com and if you click the link in the show notes you will save 20 percent off 20 percent off to help you start personalizing your home ramikadesigns.com or even your office if you'd like to have a cool cup with one of your favorite quotes or mottos or sayings or words ramikadesigns.com you know, Christians today are viewed as haters, bigots even, dangerous extremists who are potential terrorists. You need to look out for these radicals. Christians are seen as the troublemakers ever since the January 6th incident. Christians are seen as those who are out to cause a ruckus, who are out to set the nation ablaze. Perhaps you've even heard it termed this way, white Christian nationalism and extremism is the most dangerous threat to American democracy. Some in this country believe that with their whole hearts. But is it true? Are Christians truly as dangerous as the left would have you believe? And, and in what sense are they dangerous? Are they dangerous in so much as they will cause the destruction of the nation? Or are they dangerous in so much as they will cause the destruction of the left's ideology and power grab? In what way are they dangerous? We're going to be talking to Bishop Garland Hunt on this episode, I'm super excited to have this conversation with him. Well, Bishop Garland R. Hunt is a proven strategic leader with a dynamic ministry background and extensive experience in criminal justice, religious liberty, and race relations. He recently authored a book called Crisis in America, A Christian Response, which came out in 2021. Bishop Hunt, thank you for coming on the podcast and talking with me today. Well, thank you, Jacob, J Jacob for uh, asking me to come. It's my pleasure. 
So your book, Crisis in America, released not too long ago, and it, it, uh, it was a great opportunity for you to share some of your insights about you know, having a biblical worldview, what that looks like, how people, how individuals can align themselves with Scripture, um, and, and just really a call for the church to take a stand in a culture um, that really is full of, of just followers. What led mm-hmm. you to write this book? Well, you know, I thank you, Jacob, for even asking. Again, it's blessed to be on your program. Yeah, when doing the, doing the um, those those uh, summers of just such turmoil that uh, Black Lives Matter was just really taking over the the nation, and uh, every every uh, starting from really from Michael Brown and Ferguson all the way to George Floyd, um, it just just it just illuminated, you know, major racial issues. Uh, whether they were legitimate or not, but it was basically really manifest in the context of police officers versus unarmed black men. And so that that began to be a major issue. And of course, there's a lot of violence, a lot, a lot of property damage, uh, just a lot of things that took place during that time. Well, along with that, there were also issues related to to uh, the the degradation <clears throat> and uh, social ills in society, you know, whether it was late related to same sex marriage or abortion, uh, just uh, other areas, uh, uh, tra- transgender lifestyles. Uh, what what it was important to to have a biblical view for the church, though, because we were getting our views from uh, from CNN. Or even Fox News, whatever, whatever the news that was provided, we basically would get were getting our, our our news from those sources and our understanding from those sources, as opposed to there being a prophetic voice from the church community to speak to all these major crises that was affecting our land. Not only then, but now. I mean, all, almost every component of of those things still. Is prevalent in our society, and it's basically because the church has not responded. And so, my 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 point of writing this book was to deal with the crisis, or even crises in America, and look at what is the Christian response, or maybe even more appropriately, the biblical response that we should have related to it. So, so the first part of the book, of course, deals. With uh, with us taking a watch, you know, we we're, we're responsible for this generation. We're responsible to walk, to warn our nation. We're responsible to watch and pray. So so the first components of the book actually is challenging the church to take take their their place on 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 on, on the gate and, and the post that we can't let this this generation go away without the church at least committing to taking this post and watching what is going on. And then as a result of that, interpreting it and then giving a Christian response to it. So of course, there's so many different things that are facing our nation and could not cover everything. But I did want to address some of the critical issues that were there. And some of them are pretty challenging. Some of them very challenging because I talk about some of the history of abortion and Margaret Sanger and how she believed in eugenics as it relates to 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 the the uh, what she what she called the dysfunctional or uh, uh, races in America. So any uh, there's so many crises in our nation that clearly it's it's very important for us to look at what are some of the most incredible ones that are still facing us that we don't have a response to, and that that can go from everything from abortion, and the history of it with uh, with uh, Margaret Sanger, and the whole genocidal component of eugenics. Or it can come all the way to Black Lives Matter and some of the areas of it in terms of the Marxist ideology of, of, of those that were the founders of Black Lives Matter. And then what are the impact, what's the impact of it, not only just on the, um, on the church in general, but even more specifically the black community. So, so these kind of things have to be discussed. Uh, and so I just wanted to address numbers of those issues as it relates to what's going on in our society. And the, and probably one of the key issues I talk about is is also fatherlessness in the, in the black community particularly, but even in the nation. 
I mean, in the black community, only about 72 to 75 percent of black families are, are raised in a uh, in, in a family with two 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 uh, parents, a husband and a wife, and, and so or, or I should maybe say a mo- at least a mom and a father. So, but with that being the case, there's a major problem of fatherlessness, which means that all the indicators would mean that the stacks, the life stacks are against these young black men. And so they end up getting into a pipeline of prison. So, so I mention a lot of these things. I do target sometimes the black community. Sometimes I target the church. Sometimes I talk, talk about the church universal and biblical worldview and how important it is that we can stand on the side of the Bible and not the narratives of the world. You, you mentioned something about uh, you know standing on, on the walls, keeping watch at the gate, just kind of this, this watchfulness aspect. When you when you were talking about that, I, I think somewhat of, of, of Nehemiah. When you when you read, uh, and he's rebuilding the walls, and, and he goes around and he's looking at you know the gates. The gates are, are really what's what needs to be repaired. You know, there there's still some walls, but the gates are destroyed, and, and people can just come in into this city that's defenseless because all the gates are destroyed and they're in ill repair. And so that's really what his focus is, is putting people on those gates, not only to repair the gates, but he also has to put watchmen on the gates. And so I think that's an interesting parallel. And I almost wonder, to, to, to your point earlier, you know, you, you mentioned a lot of the church and church goers and church leaders just get their worldview from what the mainstream media pushes Mm -hmm. and not really from what scripture pushes and what Mm -hmm. scripture teaches i almost wonder is is there a relationship between us forsaking the gates forsaking Mm -hmm. the walls not Mm -hmm. being watchful just kind of allowing things to come into our lives unfiltered allowing things Mm -hmm. to flow into our ears or flash before our eyes is that lack of watchfulness part of the reason why the, the church isn't able to be a voice in this dark culture? Oh, it's definitely a, a major issue. As a matter of fact, I, when, I, when I talk about this, I specifically talk about Nehemiah in, in, in the book because I really wanted to talk about a great, it's a great example of how a man was a cup bearer, but he did not actually uh, talk about him himself committing a sin, but he had a burden for the sin of, of the, those that are in his Hebrew tradition. And he cried out to God to pray and ask the Lord to forgive him. My, my whole chapter eight is actually around Nehemiah's response to crisis. And uh, if if you have a chance to read it, somebody that's listening will order it because you can order it actually off of uh, Amazon or any other online bookstore it is available. But yeah, Nehemiah saw that, that there was major t- degradation in in uh, the tearing down those those walls. And he therefore had a, had a burden, but he cried out to God first and said, Lord, forgive us. And he literally prayed that. He literally prayed that, that, that God will forgive the people of, of Israel because they have sinned. And he actually said there in, in the scripture, where he talks about, please remember what you told Moses. If you're faithful to me, I will scatter you. Uh, I will scatter you among the nations if you're unfaithful to me, I should say. And so, so but he says, I confess that we have sinned against you, and even mm-hmm. by, my own family and I have sinned. So he began to personalize the sin. Wow. And yes, it's required for us as the church to personalize the sins of our forefathers and even those that are on our, in our own generational responsibility and say, Lord, we have sinned. Not not trying to negate ourselves and say, well, no, I, I'm not responsible for this. Or, no, no, we, we all identify. Moses identified. Abraham identified. That Nehemiah identified. Daniel identified with people in his generation and many times even the forefathers and saying that we have sinned. Lord, forgive us of our sin. And he did that first, even before he got to begin to repair the walls uh, and use his favor to come in and repair the walls there in the, in the sake of, for the for the people of, of Israel, Hebrew tradition, he began to first repay, repay, pray. So I just want to say that for our nation, we have to pray first and cry out to God for God to forgive us of our sins, sins of neglect, sins of, of pride, sins of hatred, sins of murder, 
and even if you go back historically, sins of slavery, sins of Jim Crow, these kind of things, or, or if you go to on the black side, you know, sins, sins of accusation and victimization and unforgiveness, all these sins are before God, and they all come in that whole, basically, the area of pride of life, where, where we have so much pride of our life that we want to blame other people for our sins, but we have to first take responsibility. Mm-hmm. Nehemiah took responsibility for his sins, and then in Ezekiel, it begins to talk about taking that watch, that place of the watch, and that's where I, that that was what I was actually referring to because he says if the if you see the enemy coming, and you don't you don't declare that the enemy is coming or judgment's on his way, then the blood of those that you did not warn will be on your hands. So therefore, as the church, we don't have a we have a responsibility to respond. We we cannot lay back and say let the culture, let the world just take care of itself. No, we have to take that watchman position and look out prophetically and see what's going on in the nation and warn the na- the nation and say if you continue along the way you're going, you're headed for judgment. Judgment's coming because you're not doing what God's called you to do. And so the church has to take their place on the post and recognize that one, it's a, it's a place of accountability though, because if you don't do what he says and you don't warn the people, then you're responsible yourself. And I want to just say to you, Jacob, I believe the church right now, because we have not warned the people, therefore we are responsible for the sins and it basically is like having unconfessed sin that's going on in our nation and we're not doing anything about it yeah it's it's definitely difficult for any of us to want to personalize our sin we when we look around at the world we see so many things wrong with the world and and we we always tend to think that everyone else out there is the problem. I need to go out there and I need to fix them. And and you talk about Nehemiah and how when he begins to pray, he first confesses his sins. He takes ownership of the problem. And, you know, it's like the, 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 the quote, I can't remember off the top of my head who said it, but you know, what's the problem with the world? I am the problem with the world. And Nehemiah realized that even though he was going to be the one God used to fix the problems in Jerusalem to to lead the people of Israel to rebuild this city to rebuild the walls and help rebuild the temple and to to reestablish this nation. Um, he first had to humble himself and confess his sins. And I, I think, yeah, to your point, if the church wants to be this voice, we have to repent of our sins. We have to confess, and, and in order. For God to use us, because if not, he, he will not use us. God's not going to mm-hmm. use dirty vessels to pour out his pure wine. Yeah, that, that's that's exactly right. And one of the things probably with that is that, and you mentioned a very key word, it's humility. Uh, we'll, we'll probably say, I, I resist the pride, or the proud, but I give grace to the humble. Mm-hmm. He, he's going to move away from pride. And, and sometimes even when we see ourselves as victims, we still can be full of pride if we can't be broke enough to say, Lord, I've sinned, I, I repent, Lord, forgive me. Mm-hmm. Those are very key words as it relates to the, the church at large, as well as I, that I'm particularly concerned about even, quote, unquote, what they call the black church. It doesn't really matter what the color is. He's still requiring us to get on our knees before him because in, in, the, in, the, in the great day, we all will be around the throne, all races, and we all exalt in him. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We're all the tribes and all the kindreds will be exhorting him and, and speaking his glory. Because, the, but, but before we get to that point, we have to walk in a level of humility and brokenness. And when you look at our nation right now, the nation is waiting for a prophetic voice to come forth. That's why there's so much confusion. That's why there's so 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 much uh, council culture. They don't want to hear from each other. They don't want to entertain another opposing voice because the voice of the Lord is so absent right now. 
And as you know, there was always tended to be a prophetic voice that came to the kings. Uh, that, that, that there's a that's been Nathan and those those guys Samuel that that spoke to the king and told the king exactly when he went off and when he was on and he gave direction to the king. But we don't have that prophetic voice now because we're not strongly biblical. We're not getting an insight from scripture and we're allowing the world to conform our opinions to the worldly standard as opposed to a godly standard. And that's very, very important. So you can't even start this whole discussion about issues until you at least get to the point that you're willing to submit to his way. You're willing to submit to the, a biblical standard. You're willing to submit to a biblical worldview. And in that submission, God will raise you up to be able to speak to greater issues from his perspective. When you really want to understand justice, you have to go and look at it from God's perspective. As, as you said, you know, in order to begin this conversation, you have to look at it from his perspective. You have to go see what God says. And when you really understand how just God is, how holy and pure and righteous he is, or I mean, in the Bible study that, that I'm in currently, you know, in, in Daniel chapter 7, God is called the Ancient of Days, the one who is eternally mm -hmm. existent, and he is the one who takes the throne and who takes the judgment seat. He sits there in the courtroom wearing the robes of the judge to judge the world. And really all of us are guilty of sinning against him. And so if he is going to be justice, if we're going to see true justice, all of us will be mm -hmm. condemned. However, mm -hmm. he is also love. And so God brings up and raises up the eternally begotten son on the cross punishes his son for the sins of all of us who justly mm -hmm. would have been condemned. And he mm -hmm. creates a way in which we can be forgiven. And I don't think we can understand justice unless we see it that way. But also if we really want to understand racial reconciliation, you talked about all tongues, all nations and every people worship, worshiping him. After we see in Daniel chapter seven, this judge, the ancient of days, uh, mm -hmm. coming to his throne we then see the son of man coming up to the ancient of days and in, and in verse 14 it says and to him was given dominion glory and a kingdom that, that all peoples nations and men of every language might serve him we really see racial mm -hmm. reconciliation and justice served right there in Daniel chapter 7 and, <clears throat> and, and these problems are eternally eternally mm -hmm. taken care of and yet we we just strive so much, Bishop, here on earth to, to, to seek for truth, to seek for answers. You know, we've entered into a, a new era where basic truths are the casualties of mm -hmm, the political, mm -hmm. cultural wars, which really are just a visible manifestation of the spiritual war that we're all mm -hmm. involved in. So those of us who understand this truth, that, that, that God is the supreme judge of the world, that he has mm -hmm. raised up his son, he is he is— he is just, and justice has been served, and, and, and he will return to establish his kingdom. This is mm -hmm. true. How do those of us who know this respond to the loss of truth and to the, to the, strife, to the striving for seeking for this truth in this culture? Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's, that's very good. So let's, let me talk about justice, and then I'll go over to race. Um, yes, you, justice is... When you think about justice in terms of um, the way man cries out in the street for justice, probably the most impactful scripture in in the Bible, actually, as it talks about justice, is Isaiah uh, 59. And, and Isaiah 59, it just is really very clear about how God deals with justice because man, man cries out, and we know, as I referred to you earlier, men crying out during uh, the uh, Black Lives Matter time, and everybody kind of jumped on board to support what they were, were doing because people were so impacted, so devastatedly about, you know, the killing of George Floyd or, or other type of um, uh, unarmed black men in the sense of, well, you know, defund the police. I mean, they just went to all matter of extremes. 
But but when you start talking about justice, justice is that balance. It is 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 mentioned over two hundred times in the Old Testament. It actually is uh, means mishpah is giving the people what they do rather than whether it's punishment or protection or care. So so justice has a balance. But but we always want to look at justice and righteousness together. Justice must be included with with righteousness together. And one of the scriptures that speaks to that is Psalms 89, when it says righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Righteousness and justice are the foundation Mm -hmm. of your throne. And the reason why why it's so key is because most people yell for justice based upon what some people break it out and say, just us. In other words, whatever my narrative is, Whatever I want to do, if I'm a woman, then I'm looking for justice for women. If I'm looking for men, it's justice for men. If I'm gay, I'm justice for gays. If I'm black, justice for blacks. I mean, if I'm white, white privilege, white, white, white power. I mean, it, it, all these different things that come up and all of us looking for justice, but it may just be just your own group. But the Lord is, goes way beyond that. He says that first that that biblical justice, and that's really like I like I like to to describe it. Biblical justice is that it's a balance of what God says and what are his parameters. And that's what righteousness means in right standing with him. Because if you're not right in right standing with him, you're not ready for biblical justice. <laughs> you're not even mm-hmm. ready for his just his just hands. And, and, and actually, one of the things that, that Scripture says in Isaiah 59 is that no one cares about being fair or and honest. The people's lawsuits are based on lies. And, it, it, and see, that's what true justice is. It's fairness and honesty. And verse 9 says, there is no justice among us. We know nothing about right living. We look for light, but find only darkness. In other words, we're crying out for something that we don't even do, observe ourselves. We're, we're not just to ourselves. We're not. We're not operating justice alone. And it says, and we look for justice, and it never comes. And that's. And it says why. And this is the key thing in verse twelve. And I hope everybody listening will hear this. It says, for our sins are piled up before God and testify against us. Yes, we know what sinners we are, and we have rebelled and denied the Lord. We've turned our backs on God. We, we know how unfair and oppressive we've been carefully planning our deceitful lives. Our courts oppose righteousness and justice is nowhere to be found. Truth stumbles in the streets and honesty is outlawed. So. So what happens in this particular scripture is very clear, is that first he's looking at the sins of the people. So so if, if a group of people like Black Lives Matter or, or people that are in the streets crying out for justice, if they aren't treating people right, if they're committing sins against God, if they are their, their sins become so piled up against God, he doesn't hear them anyway. And he's and then they turn their backs on God, and that's obvious. Where now we're trying to 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 lose our gender, biological gender doesn't matter. What men can participate in women's sports, men can go to a locker room of a woman or, or get in a shower with a woman. Nothing just because he feels feminine that day, or same-sex marriage, or or the killing of babies in the womb. All these kind of things are showing that we're going against God. So therefore, we can't cry out for justice unless we're living a just life according to his righteousness. So there is a condition for biblical justice. So everybody in the narrative, you know, we see people in the streets, they want to cry out for it. They say, actually, truth is actually stumbles in the street because people don't, people have dropped truth. People aren't looking for truth. They, they produce a narrative. Like like Breonna Taylor, like for instance, and it gets me in trouble because people don't want to hear this. They they want to say that Breonna Taylor was killed 
in her bed or she was in her bed and she was shot in her bed and, and these cops got off free. But that's actually not true. Nobody cares about true. The reality of it is that her boyfriend started shooting with just shooting the police. They were back and forth. She was beside her boyfriend that was shooting and she was shot and killed. She was not in a bat in a bed. But but what happens is same thing with Michael Floyd. Hands up, don't shoot. He never put his hands up. He ran toward the police officer and the police officer shot him. So so the narrative becomes more important than the truth. And God sees through that. And he would never give us justice if we don't stand in for truth or righteousness. So I wanted to first start off right there. And even for, you know, Lady Justice, even when we see that, you know, her whole focus is that she has a blindfold all on and, and, and there are weights in her hand because it's supposed to be balanced of, uh, regardless of the people's race or, or their gender or what, that, that, that justice has to be true no matter what it is. That, and, and so she can't see the, the, the color or, or have any prejudice in justice. And so justice on its own doesn't have prejudice. But God says that he will not even listen to us to cry out for justice if our sins against him and, and we're, we're denying righteousness. So truth, justice, and righteousness must abide together. And then I want to talk a little bit, as you mentioned, about race. See, now, racial reconciliation is a whole other thing. Um, here you have people that, of course, have a history. We have a history from slavery. We have a history from from um, you know the abolitionist movement as, as it started moving toward Reconstruction. Then after Reconstruction, of course, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. Then you had you had the, the need the need for for that response to them. Then the Jim Crow laws and then you know civil rights legislation. All these different things came up, and this was an effort for blacks to find to find a place in the government for the government to change the laws so that that could be equality. But over the years, what has happened is black people have looked for the government to be their savior, as opposed to looking to God to be the deliverer. And, and if you're looking for a savior in government, you're going to fail. And we have to, and so what happens is in order to continue the narrative, then the people have to be victims. You have to constantly share that you are a victim in order to continue with that narrative. Well, well, we are victims. Well, okay, well, you are. But even in that, if you are a victim, then you have to still start at a place of repentance. The Bible talks about how the oppressor and the oppressed both have to cry out to God. They still need God together. So, so it doesn't matter where people have been historically. The question is, are they at the foot of the cross together now? And then God will restore. He will bring love. He'll bring reconciliation. He'll bring healing. But when we're not at that place of brokenness before him, then we're still going to be separated because, again, we haven't come to that big R. And that's repentance. So we can't get to reconciliation, which is an all word, unless we first get in the right standing with him, which is that vertical relationship with God. And then he will cause us on, on the horizontal reconciliation once we get right with him. So those are just a couple of things I wanted to bring out that I do bring out in the book. But I just wanted you to hear it because it's very vital that we have the correct message, a biblical message to the issues of the world. And most of the time, regardless of very, very, maybe very, very right wing or very, very left wing and a progressive, they're not gonna give you truth as a preeminent importance, but the truth must prevail as it relates to Christianity and biblical truth. Amen, the truth must prevail. But so often we see big corporations like Target uh, even Nike, North Face, Bud Light, and even recently a baseball team, the Dodgers, uh, who are willing to sacrifice truth in in order to mm-hmm. appease the, the the mob, and and we'll probably see more in the next month as we move into June. They join in on this mm-hmm. assault of truth, mm-hmm. leaving you know Christians and and honestly even people who are not religious but are just just want truth 
feeling like they're all alone. And the American Christian can have a hard time responding to this because mm-hmm. a lot of it mm-hmm. just seems like it's political. And, and some Christians don't want to get involved with the politics. They just want to stick to the spiritual. But I, I think mm-hmm. as you've laid out, a, a lot of the things that we're seeing happening in the political realm are because of what's happening in this spiritual realm. That's so correct. how do individuals, individual Christians respond and how should the church respond? Well, first of all, again, that we have to recognize, first we have to recognize we have a mandate. We, we do have a biblical mandate. He said, I want you to give what I've given to you. Matthew 28, he, he says, I want everything that I've given you to give it out to the nations. I want you to disciple and train them. I want you to, 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 to hear, to, to you to share the gospel to the world. Well, that is a mandate. We have the mandate also. It, it, even even if you look at the biblical mandate of Genesis and you look at the biblical mandate of the Great Commission, it says that you are to dominate. You, you take the, 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 the little, they have a the dominion over the, the fish of the sea, the fowl, the air, the creeping things. And so you take dominion and multiply. And in, in Matthew 28, it says that you make disciples of all men, you, you what what you learn to me, you teach to others. So again, there's multiplication on both sides. We we don't have the option. Jeremiah also said that that you know the word is within me, and it's like fire shut up in my bones. We cannot be quiet. We cannot allow for the world to continue on as it is without declaring the word of God. So therefore, if we can see this biblical mandate from Scripture, then the church has the responsibility before God to speak out and to speak truth and to speak a biblical standard. And many times in, in well, with politics gets involved, with, with the, the divisiveness of party and bipartisanship, what happens is it'll break up families, it'll break up a church, because people will identify with racial politics or identify with political po- political positions above Christ. They don't see how Christ is preeminent. They want to apply the Bible to their political position as opposed to living by the Bible and everything, including politics, law, medicine, all of it must be subservient to the scripture. So those are the kind of things. So the church has to be challenged and quite frankly, even as a pastor, it has to be challenged from the pulpit because even in the pulpit, many times we are hesitant to preach the gospel without caring who we offend. You don't want to offend your people. You don't want to offend the tithers. You don't want to offend visitors. And so if we're so concerned about who we offend, we cannot present the gospel in the way that God's called us to do it. Jesus didn't care. He said, listen, I'm going to come through like a whip. I'm going to knock out, c- mm. c- t- knock over tables, chairs. If you get out of my way, you're selling doves, you commercialize in my church. He said, listen, my house should be called a house of prayer and, and not a den of thieves. So he was very clear about that. The, 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 he was a stone of stumbling. Jesus did not play. He was not this soft Jesus. And we had to get this softness out of the church mm. so we can stand strong and be men and women of character and men and women of God. You know, it almost feels as if the American church has in some ways crafted a Jesus that is culturally acceptable with the chief virtue of unity. And mm-hmm. I guess what I'm worried about is, you know, if, if you're united in sin, you will be united on your way to hell. Mm-hmm. You would just have a, mm-hmm. you would just have a united group who, who has a one, you know, way destination to eternal separation from God. Yeah. Christ, yeah. as you yeah. mentioned, came and he definitely did divide. He divided those mm-hmm. in the sanctuary mm-hmm. who were those who were turning mm-hmm. it into a den of robbers versus those who were actually mm-hmm. coming to truly worship. And on that great day, yeah. he is yeah. going to divide between those who are true servants and between mm-hmm. those who he mm-hmm. never knew. So yeah. how can we, I mean, yes, there is a sense in which, you know, there is a lot of unity in the church, but we're united in truth, and that truth is Christ. So how do we begin to understand what true unity looks like versus what the world would champion as unity? Well, I'll tell you what, it, the, the Lord makes it really, really clear 
when he begins to talk about this in, uh, in John. And what the, the, I tell you what the word that he uses as opposed to unity, he uses the word oneness. Right. And he said, let them be one, even as I am the father of one. And you look at John 17, now I can, I can read this to you. It says, it says, I have manifest thy name in the earth. Thou gave, him, gave, gave us me out of the word that thine were, and thou gave us me and kept thy word. But then he goes on further, saying, I pray for them, and I pray not for the world, but for them that have given me. All are mine and thine are mine. I am glorified. And he says, let them be one, even as I, you, and the Father are one. He said that they may be one as we are. So oneness is much better than unity. And I use this expression like, for instance, a football team can be, can be unified. In other words, if you're black or white or Hispanic or Italian, you all can play, be on defense together if you're playing football or offense together, and you can be on the same team. So you're unified by, by win and loss on a team. But in the scriptures, it speaks of oneness. And the only way you can really be one is you have to die to yourself. Mm-hmm. There's a part of you that has to die your ambition, your pride, your selfishness, your unforgiveness. But if we truly can be like that, just one-on-one with each other, can you imagine the strength of the church if we are dying to ourselves and willing to say that I'm, I put down ambition, I put down my pride, I put down my, 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 my desire to be noticed, I die to all that, I will become a servant as Jesus was, and I'm willing to serve each other. We're willing to love each other unconditionally. We're willing to give ourselves to each other. So therefore, oneness is even better than unity, which is even, even better than sitting side by side of a black and a white. You, you can, integration as they used to call it. So integration is not enough. Unity is not enough. It's oneness. And John 17 really does a good, ch- a good challenge in understanding that he's calling for them to be one, just like Jesus and the Father are one. He's saying, let my disciples be one. And he said, and the glory which thou given me. And I love that in 21 and 22, I guess it kind of sums it up. In, in 21 and 22 or 17, it says that they may be one as thou of our father art in me and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave us me, I give it unto them that they may be one even as we are one. So, so the glory of God is what causes us to be one. If we submit to him, if we yield to him, well, he'll cause us to be that, that oneness that God's called us to be, to, to walk in. And then in that, that'll be different than just a basketball team or football team or co-workers at work. No, they may, they may be unified under a boss, but he's saying being one under Jesus Christ is our Lord. Mm. So as we begin to wrap up our conversation, uh, and this is this has been wonderful, and you've said so many things that I hope people will go back and just listen to and write down and just think upon and pray about. But you, you had mentioned towards the beginning, you specifically mentioned Nehemiah was a cupbearer, and and that got me thinking. You know, a lot of Christians think that the only way they can make an impact. And, and, and respond to these issues that we've been talking about, whether it's transgender ideology, whether it's LGBT, whether it's uh, you know racial reconciliation, or you name it. A lot of people think the only way they can make an impact is by running for office, joining a think tank, moving to D.C., writing for a news outlet, starting a podcast, doing a YouTube channel, or just something like that. But, you know, I almost wonder, what can we learn about Nehemiah as a cupbearer? How can mm-hmm. Christians mm-hmm. make a positive impact and shine in their daily nine to five? Mm-hmm. Well, well, Jesus said himself, he said, I, I came to you not as one to be served, but I came to you as one to, that serves. In other words, I'm the server. If he was, if we were at a, a major dinner and, and so the waiter came by to take care of the table, 
Jesus would be the waiter, not the one that's being served, because he is the server. And he wants us to understand that serving each other is what causes us to have the, uh, the background and gives us the notoriety and it gives us the history to be able to lead. But you find, you learn leadership by serving. Serving is it. So, and even when you do walk in service, that's even something called servant leadership, that you serve the people when you lead the people. So, so you never get away from serving. You get never get away from giving of yourselves. So this is why when, when Nehemiah was chosen and told about the devastation of the tear down down the walls and the fire that took place there, and he realized that the children of Israel were unprotected. He went then to to the to his king because he was a cupbearer, and he had therefore had favor with the king because he had been such a, a faithful cupbearer. And out of that relationship, he had the, 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 there was nothing that the king wouldn't give him. As a matter of fact, he even wrote letters to other kings and other authorities to give him what he needs because he recognized that this this was too important for Nehemiah, not because he necessarily saw it himself, but because of the relationship he had. We build our relationships not by demanding or being dominant. We, 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 we earn our relationships by being a servant, being forgiving, and being walking in humility. And I think Nehemiah showed that from the onset, even before the crisis comes, and I guess I want to emphasize that, there are going to be so many crises, there's so many things out here, but we have to see ourselves as a servant. Now, I don't mind a person that wants to run for office. I don't mind a person that wants to do a podcast. I don't mind that. But the key is, are they serving those that they are speaking to, or are they doing it for their own selfish pride and prestige? Mm. So it goes to motivation more than it does to those actions. So but if a person is just like a pastor of a church, I'm a pastor. If I go before the people because I want to be adored, I want everybody to call me bishop, I want to be just worshiped, then of course that 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 right there would not only be a stumbling block for my people, but that would turn God against me. And he'll say to me, I never knew you. Well, you say, well why? I cast out devils in your name. I, 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 I serve the people. He said, well, no, no. I never knew you because your attitude, your motivations were wrong. So the only way to prove to him that I'm willing to serve is I must be a faithful shepherd because a shepherd serves his sheep as not so much he demands the sheep, a beat, he, he serves the sheep. So that's one of the things that's so very vital in understanding that nothing's wrong with leadership and aggressive leadership, but it's all in the heart and it's all in serving. And it's all in humility and brokenness. Yeah, it's been asked a lot this year. Um, I know in, in, in circles I'm around, how do you take a stand? How do you even begin to take a stand for Christ? And I, I think you really, you know, spoke to that very clearly there. And it's that, you know, your motives have to be right first. You have to be seeking to glorify God in all things, to magnify Christ serving him and serving those mm -hmm. around you otherwise your stand is going to be in vain and it, it's mm -hmm. not going to make an eternal impact because when you get to eternity as you said he's going to say mm -hmm. depart from me i never knew you mm -hmm. bishop do you have any mm -hmm. final thoughts for the audience before we go well well i guess i would just say you know i don't sometimes repeating yourself is good i want to just say this to you to those that are listening, and I, I don't know how far and broad this is, but if you consider yourself a church, a, a Christian, and you're not understanding that Christianity and Christ supersedes everything, I don't care what your race is, I don't care what your occupation is, I don't care what your career is, I don't care what family you're in. He says even. If you don't hate your mother, your brother, your sister, your brother, your sister, your your children, your, your those sister in laws, all, all, if you don't hate your family more than me, you're not worthy of me. So even your family can't come close to your love for him. So I will start off with the church, and I'll say, church, Jesus must be first in everything. 
Don't try to fit Jesus into the narrative of your opinion. Your opinion and narrative must be preceded by Christ and you must think like him. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. If you don't know the Lord and you're listening to this, please don't allow one more moment to go by. Don't let this moment pass you by. Give your life to Jesus right now. Let the declare him as your personal Lord and Savior. Confess and repent of your sins and allow him to be the Lord of your life. This must take place for you to even have a chance of surviving in that day. But I'm telling you right now, as a Christian or even an unbeliever, we have to all come to the same place, and that's the foot of the cross. The foot of the cross is where full deliverance and healing and transformation takes place. So that's what I would encourage each one of those that are listening that, that find your place at the foot of the cross. Bishop, we, we have about a minute. Would, would you be able to end us in, in prayer, pray for those who are lost, but just also pray for, for the Christians who are listening? Yes. But I just, I pray out of a broken heart myself because I, I, I know as I share sometimes I, passionate about it, but Lord, uh, my brokenness is much greater than my passion. Lord, I pray, Father, that those that are here, the voice of the Lord through my voice, if you can hear the Lord through my voice, hear what the Lord is saying. The Lord is saying to you to rise and shine. Come out of your stupor. Come out of your sleep. Wake up. I have a calling on your life. I have a purpose for your life. Don't let the generation suck you up into a, a narrative or a lifestyle or a culture that's, that's moving away from God and turn their backs on God. Wake up, church. Stand on the calling of God. Stand on the fulfillment of the mandate of God. Stand on the Great Commission. Multiply yourself. And most importantly, live according to the Word of God at all costs, at all times. And I pray, Father, that there would be a hedge of protection around those that are standing, that righteous remnant that refuses to bow. But I pray a hedge of protection around them, even as Jacob is making this stand to do this podcast, a hedge of protection around him, so that no weapon formed against him will prosper, as well as those are listening that are call themselves standing for Christ, let no weapon formed against them prosper. And I bless you now for all these things. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Bishop Garland Hunt, author of Crisis in America, A Christian Response. Hope you enjoyed this conversation. Please check out the show notes. It will include a link to connect with Garland Hunt as well as to purchase his book. I highly encourage you to check it out if you want to hear more of the thoughts and of the wisdom and the insight that uh, Bishop has shared with us in this episode. I just want to remind all of you once again of the reconciliation, the healing, the joy, the happiness the inexpressible beauty and one that will be the multitude around heaven's throne worshiping the king, King Jesus, who is rightfully seated upon that throne. Revelation 7, 9 says, After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. The multitude that no one could number. When you look at presidential rallies, journalists work so hard to figure out exactly how many were in attendance because we're going to make that the headline. We want to report on just how many are in attendance for this candidate 
because perhaps that'll shed light on just how well they are doing in this race. Well, the journalists that day will be scratching their heads. No one can number how many are in attendance today. And not only that, but these people couldn't do enough to earn their place here before heaven's throne, before the Lamb. They are clothed in robes and palm branches are in their hands and they're worshiping the King. And they don't even deserve to be here, but because of the one who is seated upon the throne, because of what he did for them, they are here. Justice was served on Calvary's hill as God poured out his wrath on his begotten son who is eternally begotten from the father. There is where truth begins. There is where reconciliation begins. I hope, I hope to see you there on that day. At Real Jacob Kersey on the socials, Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you back next time on the podcast.